as Lisa said, like, I'm going to give a, a, an overview of uh, the importance of collecting data for uh, building the models, particularly the DFM models. So we're going to have a, a quite a long, well, relatively long section about the introduction to DFM modeling and then FEMDEM modeling, which is find a difference element method for simulation of uh, rock slope problems. So this is the outline of the presentation. So we're going to talk about the FM modeling, what is the FM modeling, then the importance of collecting data. We have to remember that this is a model, so we need to have good data to build uh, a reliable model. Then application to rock engineering problems, specifically to slope problems, and a quick discussion about limitation and uh, problems we may have with these numerical models. So going to the principle of the FM model, for the people that are not familiar with the uh, approach, this is what the FM model is. It's basically a method to build three-dimensional representation of fractured rock masses. So we collect data in the field, we use that data to build these models, and we can see that we're going to build these uh, fractures within the volume. The volume not necessarily has to be a, a block, like a, a cube. It can be any volume. Of course, as you basically make uh, the volume more complicated, the more complicated it is to build the, the model. What is very important to realize about the FEM modeling is that it's a stochastic process. Because a stochastic process means it's a probabilistic approach. So every time we generate a model, we're going to end up with different realization. They look different in terms of geometric uh, representation, but they are based on the same statistics. So we're going to see later some uh, example what it means, uh, this uh, stochastic process when it comes to uh, application and uh, design slopes. In terms of properties, I just basically uh, limit myself to the properties that are used for geomechanical models. The DFM models was initially developed for a hydrogeological application. I only refer to the strictly property that are used strictly for a geomechanical application, like a fracture orientation, fracture size, based on the length of the fractures, fracture intensity, how many fractures do we use to populate the, the volume. And then there are other properties like fracture terminations and fracture spatial model that are very important to basically relate the fractures to each other. And you can see here that what we have when we look at the parameters, those parameters are not included as a deterministic value, but are used based on uh, statistical distribution. We have to specify what is this distribution, what are the parameters of this distribution, the mean, the average. But we're going to have a, a distribution, we're going to sample for that distribution when we run the Monte Carlo simulation to generate the model. So if we look at now in details to those uh, um, data that we need, let's start with fracture orientation. So what we have fracture orientation, we collect the data, we have a steroid, basically a population of poles that represents our planes, pattern feature, joint feature, folds, shear zones, and we basically use all this data on a, on a steroid. What we try to do with the DFM model, we try to use as many data as possible. We don't want to basically leave uh, data out of the, the model. If you use the standard basic method, like a DIPS type of approach with windows, what we end up with is like selected regions. We only get the mean, maybe that region, and we just exclude any, uh, any other data outside those regions. But those regions basically gives you like the vari variability of the model. So we try to use as many data as possible in the FM model. So we have uh, maybe different type of distribution, like Fisher distribution, bivariate distribution, Bingham distribution, or we can use also this uh, bootstrapping distribution, which is not a true statistical distribution. It's just a method to uh, sample the steronet in the model. We generate some dispersion of the data we collected, and we, cre uh, re we create a pseudo-replica of our basically map data. And especially when we use bootstrapping by any type of distribution, we have to remember that orientation data is biased. So it depends on the uh, orientation of the bow that we use to collect the data or the direction of the sampling plane that we use to collect the data. So we always have to basically correct those uh, data to make sure that they account for uh, orientation bias. 
when it comes to intensity, we have uh, different measures that we can use. We talk about, again, the number of fractures that we want to use to populate the, the region. So what we have typically that we can use is the number of fractures per unit length. If you use a scan line or a borehole, we can use a total length of fractures per unit area if we look at the surface outcrop. Or ideally, we would like to use area of fractures per unit volume. The reason why we would like to use this so-called P32 is because the P10, number of fractures per unit length of P21, length of fractures per uh, unit area, those are, again, directionally dependent. Depends on the orientation of the boreholes, whether you have many or fewer fractures. Same for the P21, it depends on the orientation of the plane, whether you, you intersect more or fewer basal fractures. So you want to stay in a, an intensity value which is orientation independent. Then also you're going to have other type of measurements like density measurement or porosity measurement that we don't really use for geomechanical applications. This are, again depends on, uh, it's more difficult to really collect in the field. When it comes to build the model, okay, we have the rotation and we can get that values relatively easily. Intensity, again, we can basically map the P10, map the P21, and relate it back to the P32. It's a simple linear correlation. And we can use simulated sampling to get the P32. The most critical parameter for any DFM model is the length. The reason why it's critical and why it's difficult to measure is because, first of all, what we measure is two-dimensional information on, on a plane, on, a, on the wall of a, of a drift in a mine or a surface outcrop. And those basically lines correspond to the intersection of three-dimensional fractures with that uh, specific uh, plane. So what we see is just intersections that core to a disk if we assume the fractures are basically circular. So it's difficult basically to relate the fracture length to the actual fracture radius that generated that fracture length. And also, most of the time, we actually don't have access to fracture length data because during the feasibility study, basically at the beginning of a project, we don't have access to surface outcrops, particularly when we only have borehole data, so we don't have length data whatsoever. So that's actually another problem we may have to face when we generate these models. But assuming that we have access to field data for length, then we can basically process this intersection, these lines, and derive the fracture radius distribution. And there are different methods to do that. You can have analytical methods, Van der Einstein method, based on the model approach that accounts for uh, uh, truncation bias and sensory bias. So when we have these fractures exposed in, a, in an outcrop, we cannot map the full length of those fractures because maybe they terminate in bulk or because maybe they extend outside what we call the window that we use for mapping. We can use analytical uh, simulated sampling, where basically we generate the model based on the, some assumption we've done for orientation intensity. We estimate the length, we generate the model, we check whether what we obtain in the model matches what we map in the field, and we uh, keep basically iterating as, until we basically we have a, a good fit with the data we collect in the field. If we have uh, access to bigger structures like major folds or intermediate features, we can maybe do a scaling uh, approach where we characterize the length at a large scale, intermediate scale, and we basically relate back to the one the minus at the uh, at the at a minor scale, like maybe bench scale, like 20 meter scale. We use, for example, this approach where we analyze data for one of the largest open pit mine in the world, Chukikamata. That mine, just to give you some dimension, is uh, three kilometers wide in one direction, two kilometers wide in another direction, and one kilometer deep. So it's a big hole in the ground. So you have access to pretty large, large features that you can use to extrapolate the data for the smaller feature. One value that, again, we don't map uh, many times just because we don't have actually access to surface outcrops is the so-called terminations. Terminations are very important because, uh, because they give, give us an idea of the connectivity of the fracture network. This is, for example, is what we call a T-type connectivity. So we have one feature, like a minor feature, ending 
on a major feature, like in the case of a stratigraphic unit, you have bedding planes and cross joints. We have uh, maybe uh, X types termination, where basically one joint crosses each other. So we can use this data, whether for as an input, the T type can be actually an input in the model. Very important to basically determine the connectivity of the model and the overall fragmentation, natural fragmentation of the rock mass. The X type uh, uh, connection um, termination uh, could be very important for validation of the model. But again, we don't really uh, collect this data much. So we have to think about like maybe where we go in the field and we want to do like a model, a DFM model, basically change the way we collect our data to account for these terminations. So eventually we have all the data we need to build the model. When we build the model, we have to think about are we building it at a small scale or the large scale? This is a very, what I call small scale model. So you have uh, a pillar from a Milton mine in the UK. We mapped two, uh, two faces of the pillar. So we have basically, we avoid the direction dependence of the data. We have orientation data intensity and length. We generate this model. And what we have is then a model that we can basically sample to get maybe a uh, two-dimensional place to run in the geomechanical model, three-dimensional model to run in a three-dimensional geomechanical model. This model only would only apply to that particular pillar or two pillars, let's say, around that pillar that we mapped. It should not be used to extrapolate data for maybe 500 meters away because it's just a local model. This actually instead is a model that we built for a mine in Australia. It's a block cave mine. So you have this is the deposit that's going to basically be extracted by block caving method. So you can see there's definitely much bigger, just give an idea of the dimension. This block is uh, uh, long about 1.4 kilometers. It's 700 meters high and it's actually located at 1.3 kilometers depth. So it's a quite big deposit. It's a gold deposit. It's actually the mines with production. So this pre-feasibility was done in 2008. The, the mines with production. So what they do is basically they undercut the deposit and they extract the ore by um, blocking method. In this case, to build this model, we have basically used lots and lots of uh, boreholes. So you see these are just some of the boreholes. The boreholes give, give information about the orientation and the intensity. Using a geostatistical approach, we can basically interpolate the data between the different boreholes and we come up with areas of lower intensity, high intensity. So very fractured rock mass, poorly fractured rock mass. So very massive and very blocky. For blocky mines, we want to have something which is very blocky. So here, we're probably going to have no problems in uh, advancing the cave. Here, eventually, as the cave progresses, actually, the rock is going to fragment later on. So again, it should not be uh, much of a problem. But in this case, you can see that we have something at the kilometer scale. So we have to include also, in that case, major features. Eventually, once you build the model, you should always validate your model. So, to validate your model, you're going to look at the orientation that you mapped, and you do a comparison of what you mapped. You look at the intensity that you mapped, and you compare on what basically the model tells you in terms of intensity. As I said before, the data that is most difficult to validate is the fracture size, just because sometimes we actually don't have access to fracture size. And later on in the presentation, we're going to discuss the limitation uh, of this basically lack of data when it comes to the uncertainty that is built into the model. So let's now step back uh, actually the data collection. So we talk about the, the problem of how we get the data for these models. In terms of rock mechanics, in terms of how we collect the data, we typically use guidelines like the, the one provided by International Society of Rock Mechanics. You can see the date 1981, certainly old guidelines probably need some upgrade just to account for the new methodologies, the new methods that we use in characterizing the strength or the fabric of the rock mass. But just looking back at these uh, guidelines, what it tells you is that we have three different, three main methods for mapping. One is the spot mapping, so correct data based on a very subjective approach. This fracture, but not this one, this one, but not this one. Just based on engineering judgment, very subjective method. Or you can have a more objective sampling, like scanline mapping, window mapping. Again, we map everything that may be intersected a given scanline, or we map everything that is within a certain area. We have some uh, assumption to make in terms of truncation. 
or basically what is the maximum, uh, the minimum length that we're going to map, again, that could be subjective, but the overall method is objective because we will map anything that would either intersect the scan line or be contained in the window. But when we think about mapping, and let's say we go in the field, this is actually Chukikamata mine in Chile. This is from a paper from Flores and Kazulovic. This is one of the walls of Chukikamata mine. What you can see here is that you definitely have like natural fractures, but also you have lots of glass fractures. So the question is, as an engineer, we go there in the field, we, ask, we are asked to map these features. We need to differentiate whether we deal with natural fractures, glass fractures, or stress-induced fractures. The model should only have natural fractures. The model represents the DFM model of the virgin rock mass. We should not include blast fractures or damage because that should be generated later maybe in the geomechanical model. It should not be included in the DFM model. They only represent, would only represent the virgin rock mass. One other thing that to consider is that we build a model. The model is going to have an application, particularly for maybe stability problems. So when we look at the mapping, at a, at a rock face, like this is from a, in a Canadian Rockies, uh, close to Jasper, in, a, in the state of a, in the province of Alberta. We are, clearly we have a, a topping problem. So if we have to map this feature, we should know that okay, we know we want data on the joints that are actually uh, deep into the slope. If we have a scan line, basically in this direction, we basically miss actually the joints that actually creates the problems. So always should always ask ourselves what could be the likely failure mechanism because we want to make sure that we don't miss that fracture set that should cause the failure mechanism. And again, then you have then, as I said before, different scale for mapping. You can maybe map at a small scale. This is a road cut of uh, the highway that basically goes from Anchorage to Whittier in Alaska. This is a big canyon mine before the failure. This is taken in 2008. There was a massive failure a couple of years ago where a large portion of this slope basically fell and basically uh, filled the pit. But just to give you an idea, like here you have maybe just one lithology, no major structures, just mostly like joint sets at the 20 meter scale. Here you have different lithology, you have major features, folds, shield zones, different basically geotechnical domains. They all have to be represented in the model. And you have basically look at also the the relationship between those two technical domains. So I would say relatively easy to build this model, way more complicated to build this model. And in this case, definitely going to need to include predefined features that correspond to their faults, and they have to be located in the right position. We cannot just simulate those stochastically. That's why I call about hybrid models. Hybrid model, the FM models, is when you have stochastic features and deterministic features in the same model. This is very important, especially when you know that you may have some instability which are localized. When it comes to mapping on the ground, the difficulty may be just the fact that the dimensions are much smaller, the drift they are not very high. This is a Middleton mine in the UK, this is a Roman pillar mine in limestone. These pillars are seven meters high. In, in places, they're actually a mine by double benching to 14 meters high. But again, you're going to be limited in terms of dimension of the feature you're going to see. You're not going to see anything basically above, let's say, 8 meters in these photographs because you're going to have the roof of the mine and the floor of the mine that basically stops you from uh, seeing basically feature extended above or below. You may have problems with lighting. You're not going to see much in the dark, especially if you don't have like powerful floodlights. So there's some limitations that are just due to the fact that it's a uh, just constraint, just physical constraints when it comes to mapping on the ground. What we can do now is that we can actually overcome some of those limitations, particularly in the surface mining, using uh, remote sensing techniques. We can use LiDAR, we can use photogrammetry to collect data from a safe distance. In an open pit mine, typically we are not allowed to actually approach the face. We are asked to basically map from a distance, so it's difficult to actually get orientation, intensity, and length if you can actually touch the rock with your hands. But if you use LIDAR, LIDAR or uh, photogrammetry, we can actually basically get information about intensity, orientation, and length. There are limitation that we have to be aware when we're dealing with these remote sensing techniques. That again, the, uh, relative to the geometry of the angle which we basically take the measurement with respect to the angle which these features actually 
coming up to the, the face. We can also apply this method on the ground, although yet again, to deal with the constraints of the uh, lack of good lighting at the ground, maybe like more dust uh, present on the ground. What we do basically, we map from a safe distance, consider operations going on in the mine, but we can still collect data from a safe distance, we can interpret the, this information later on in the office, and we basically get information present in this case specifically about orientation. This is actually was uh, done uh, with manual mapping, this is actually the actual uh, remote sensing mapping, so you can see that actually there's a match between the two. It's always a good approach to actually possible to combine both remote sensing and manual mapping all the times because sometimes maybe lacking some data when we do uh, remote sensing. And vice versa, we may miss some data when we do uh, manual mapping. So going back now to the modeling and specifically to the FM modeling. So if the FM model is stochastic, automatically that says, oh, we cannot use spot mapping. That's very subjective, should not be used for stochastic analysis. We can only use an objective sampling to do a stochastic analysis. So that leaves us with scan line or window mapping. The other thing you have to consider when you measure uh, data uh, for the modeling, particularly in this case, the FM modeling, is that we're gonna, we're not gonna map everything. We're gonna map maybe every features above one meter, and again, there's some constraints in terms of maximum length due to the, maybe to the physical the geometry of the problem, or the fact that we don't see anything above a certain distance. So we map everything, for example, let's say you can just slide between 20 and 30 meters. That's the that data you mapped, that's the intensity that you mapped. If you go back in the office, you do the model, and you forget about this constraint, these truncations, and you basically spread basically your intensity over an uh, unlimited range, what happens is that your model is going to underestimate the intensity. So we always have to be aware of any basically constraint that we have imposed in the mapping, and that has to be recreated in the model. In terms of just uh, general basically knowledge of data, so that's what we want to basically end up with is like this quite sophisticated models, continuum discontinuum models that have embedded discrete fraction network features. But before that, we have to characterize the rock mass, and before that, we actually have to collect the data. Most of the times, particularly at the beginning of a project, we are here in what we call basically low knowledge or almost like complete ignorance. So we have very limited data we have to work with. This is what we call epistemic uncertainty, taken from a paper that John Harrison presented two years ago at the conference in Turin. So this terminology about the fact that it's limited knowledge, that's the uncertainty that's associated with limited knowledge. Ideally, as we progress maybe with the data collection, we get more and more data, we end up in what we call the auditory variability. We have enough data to be characterized in a statistical way. We will never have complete knowledge. This is a, is a limit state but we have enough data to characterize the variability of the data. And that's ideally where we want to basically be when we deal with the sophisticated models. One of the things to consider when it comes to data collection and this uh, concept of epistemic uncertainty and electronic variability is the fact that sometimes we're dealing with, uh, we introduce uncertainty, not because we don't have the data. In this case, even if we have lots of data, but we characterize the data in the wrong way, we end up with a subjective characterization. So we end up in the epistemic uncertainty uh, field because maybe we use the wrong uh, intervals to characterize the length in this particular case. If we use like a more objective uh, beam based sequence, now you can see that we have a better basic distribution of the data and it's easy to get the mean and standard deviation of the data compared to this example here. Where basically by using bigger bigger basic beans, completely subjective, so basically they are not basically uniform, we may actually end up with a system where it's very difficult to define what is the, the mean and standard deviation of that uh, population. On the other end of the scale, let's say we have very little data, so we are getting the epistemic uncertainty. Yes, we could in the reality build a model, but we have, let's say, fill the gaps to build the model. So what happens is that we end up with a lack of data 
and we have this, you have to fill the gaps with some, uh, to create some kind of a way to get the mean standard deviation for that data. So let's jump on the numerical simulation of scale effects with some application for uh, this, uh, the FN, Fender model. So before we actually go into this uh, numerical models, we're dealing with uh, three-dimensional models. So we, the FN models are 3D, 3D uh, as nature, but most of the time we're dealing with uh, three-dimensional geomechanical models. Not because we don't want to do three-dimensional models, but because the dimensional models are quite uh, time-consuming when it comes to uh, running the models. So what we have to do, we basically we have to run two-dimensional model takes section from the DFM model, but we have to be aware of the limitation imposed by the plane, out of plane, uh, plane strength assumption that we have in the models. If you look at this basically section here, they're taken by uh, from this technically these models here. This is the to this section that would correspond to this two-dimensional model. This is to this section that would correspond to this model. But in reality, this to this section here was actually taken by two, that two dimension, three dimensional model, but this section here was actually taken by this three dimensional model here, which is not the one we actually simulating today. So the filtering, the sampling of the fractures from 3D to 2D is very important. We don't want to introduce artifacts in the model by using the wrong section. It doesn't basically uh, account for plane strain uh, modeling. So when it comes down to application and FEMDEM application, FEMDEM is nothing but an hybrid final element discrete element package. So what we have is that, you know, our basic final element mesh that is allowed to break upon based on some uh, specific criteria, more cool or ranking uh, criteria in this case. So what we simulate is the interaction between joints and new fractures that are generated in the model. So we take the fractures from the DFM model, from the section, that we basically transfer to the Fender model, and then we run the Fender model to look at the uh, geomechanical behavior. So in terms of application, let's start again with uh, something simple first, and then we look at the slopes. One thing that we always have to face in rock mechanics is establishing the strength of the material. If we have a model that ideally, which we could use a very, very small mesh, like centimeter mesh, then we don't have to worry much about the properties we include the model. It's simply the interlock strength that we can map, that we can measure in the lab, joint properties, again, that we can get from a lab laboratory test. We put everything to the model and we run the model and we don't worry about the scale effects. But when we start to build very large, feet, large models, we cannot use very small meshes. Maybe you end up with meshes which are meter scale. Then we have to represent the strength of the rock at the meter scale. So it's very important to characterize the strength of the rock at different scale before we actually run maybe large scale models for slope problems. This is an example of uh, an ISO scale effects for pillars from a mine in, uh, in the US. So what we've done here, we have a large pillar, 40 meters high and 70 meters wide. In the mine, actually, they're actually using even taller pillar, but still with the same aspect ratio, 0.5 aspect ratio with y ratio. So relatively slender pillar. So this slender pillar here, we simulate the behavior of that slender pillar, then we take a portion of the slender pillar and we model the behavior of that pillar, that's the pillar B, and we do the same for pillar C and D. So we go from larger pillar to smaller pillar, but with the same aspect ratio. And what we can see is that the strength decreases from pillar D to pillar A, so basically gets weaker and weaker, but eventually kind of approach like a, a constant strength is equivalent to the representative element volume, so that volume of rock mass will have that uh, uh, overall strength, which is just in this case almost like less than a third of what we get at the maybe the intermediate scale and just actually like less than six of what we get at the laboratory scale. And we can basically correlate the behavior in the field with the behavior you get in the lab. This is an analytical solution proposed by Brown. We can also look at the different behavior in terms of uh, more elastoplastic for a larger feet, larger scale, more uh, brittle failure you can get at the, the smaller scale. So if you use this method, which let's say synthetic rock, rock mass method to characterize the strength of the rock mass, 
Then we use this approach maybe to characterize the strength of the small scale, and we feed the small scale strength in the large scale models. We can do the same there with compressing models. We can do the same if you look at the sh uh, shear box type of test. So in this case, the shear basically uh, cubes. We look at the behavior of uh, this cubic shear, and we also look at the scale effects for these uh, cubes, and we get basically the same type of behavior. So kind of uh, reduction in strength as we increase the size of the sample, going from 2 meters to 20 meters. And you can validate these models by looking at the, again, look at Brown approach. You can see that the laboratory, uh, the numerical test basically match quite nicely would be the analytical solution proposed by Oken Brown. And actually then you can relate the scale of the model to the GSI, geological strength index, using the analytical solution. So it would also work both for compressible shear type of failure, but also would also work, it's not included here, but also for the tensile region. So also in, tensile, in the tensile field, you also have scale effects that we have to consider. One thing that is very important, and I mentioned in the presentation about the stochastic approach of the defense approach, is that if I take different models, generated from the same three-dimensional model, we take different sections, here you have three different models, 20, 20C, 20D. They would behave completely different in this case. 20 is the one, model 20 is the one which is the weakest one. 20D is the strongest one. This is an uh, upside down shear box uh, type of arrangement. But just because we have some features align preferentially with the line uh, direction of shearing, they will give you a much weaker response compared to 20D, which actually doesn't have these features. So you can see now the importance of running multiple realization because you want to capture the overall basically mechanical response of the log mass. Running only one model, maybe in this case 20D, will give you the wrong impression the rock is actually quite strong. So with that in mind, we can jump into the large scale features. So that's what I meant before with synthetic rock mass models. So we run these models at the smaller scale can have lots of details, centimeter or even less the centimeter scale, all the features that we map in the field. We, we look at the strength of these models, and then we use this strength to fill the gaps, per se, in a larger models where you only put uh, major features, like major structures. Instead of using an equivalent continuum approach based on RMR, Q, or GSI, we try to characterize better the strength of the rock using these numerical methods and the field data, and then we use that strength, this SRM strength, in between the largest features. In a ideal world, we actually would like to model this paint with all the features, but that would take basically uh, days to run just because we have to use a much a smaller mesh. And sometimes it's not even possible because that would mean running with millions of elements. And those calls cannot basically accept those uh, number of elements. So let's see some application now of this kind of a SRM, uh, open pick type of approach. So let's start with something very simple. Technically, in this case, we only have one feature. So we don't actually uh, use more than one feature. We have a large, uh, uh, would be a fault or shield zone behind basically a slope in a quite relatively big uh, open pit mine. It's a 500 meter open pit or conceptual. And we look at what happens in terms of strength of the rock bridge as we basically make the rock, rock bridge smaller and, and also as we change the strength of this rock bridge. So if we have a relatively small rock bridge, just one meter, as you excavate that uh, slope, eventually you will basically end up with the, the model failing the rock bridge. The stress is imposed on the block at the end of the basically the paper enough to basically crack the rock and basically you form a new surface and that block will basically fail. For a 5 meter rock bridge, again, it will actually fail later on because it's a little bit more stresses, but eventually will fail anyway because the rock bridge is not enough to sustain the driving forces that mobilize along that very large persistent feature. If you look at a 20 meter rock bridge, you still damage, you see damage, but that damage is, doesn't generate a persistent basically, uh, failure plane, so the block is potentially unstable, but it's not released from the, from the slope. If you go 
into basically more complex situation. Now we're dealing with a 800 meter open pit. Mm -hmm. So the same size of a Binion Canyon mine a few years ago, but this is actually not the Binion Canyon, it's a totally conceptual model, but it's the, almost the same scale. And here we done a simulation using different John sets. So we have different orientation. In this case, we have two sets at 80 degrees dipping, one into the slope, one outside the slope, and a 10 degrees uh, shallow feature. In the other basically models, we run the same basically 80 degrees dipping into the slope joint. We have one which is like a little bit less at 30 degrees, 60 degrees into the slope, but we increase the size, uh, sorry, the dip of the joint set coming out of the slope from 10 to 30 degrees. You already can see the difference in terms of failure mechanism, in terms of deformation. The model with the 10 degrees basically dipping joints shows some deformation, less than 20, 20 centimeters, but again, some cracking, some yielding, but overall the, the, the slope is stable. With a GSI equivalent of 70. GSI 70 means the rock in between those joints are equivalent to GSI 70 using the SRM approach that I showed you before. If we make this rock mass stronger from GSI 70 to 80 and 90, we can see that the deformation gets smaller and smaller because the rock is much stronger, so we don't have failure of the rock bridges. But as soon as we switch to a 10 degrees dipping out of the slope joint, now we see that there's much more deformation developing to the slope. And even if we limit, or let's we'll say we increase the strength of the rock bridges, we still have relatively like large deformation, several benches, with quite basically large deformation above almost one meter deformation developing to the slope. So you can see the importance, the relative importance of characterize the strength of the rock bridge and characterize the joint uh, characteristic in terms of uh, structure, this feature in terms of orientation. Of course, you should also look in terms of strength properties of the joints. That becomes very important. Just a model here, some simulations, just to show what it means running the fan dam model, the way we look like in this terms of animation. It's a much smaller uh, slope, 100 meter high, to use to simulate toppling failure, flexor toppling. I actually run, let the model run, so it actually simulates the run out of the material as well. So you can see that initially there was some damage, it created like a basal plane, along with basically the toppling is mobilized, the blocks are basically the toppings are moving, the blocks start basically rumbling, and then eventually end up with a quite basically large basically debris flow, uh, flow debris at the base of the slope. In terms of modeling, what happens is that you start with a finite element, break the mesh, and now you're dealing with a discrete element. So you have to basically account for all the contents between the features. So the model runs relatively fast in the beginning, it gets slower and slower because now you have to deal with hundreds of thousands of contests They have to be basically be uh, checked to make sure that we, uh, we don't end up with blocks maybe penetrating each other. And uh, one last example, this is Divic mine in, uh, in, in Canada. This is some models we did uh, for uh, looking at the stability of the, the slopes. Two things to see here is that this is just two examples of a section from the model. So this is your three-dimensional model. That's the section for the open pit. Just two sections, five for E and two one E. The difference between is just the realization. But you can see that you see different features that may be mobilized in the, in the section in terms of 2D modeling. That will correspond to completely different type of failure mechanisms in terms of uh, how easy it's actually to fill the, the slope. So this actually highlights again the importance of running multiple realization and switching from a more just a deterministic simulation with one single factor of safety to a probability of factor of safety because you're dealing with different basic, uh, possibility of failure, different failure mechanisms that may be mobilized in slow. One other thing to, to remember actually taken from this model is the fact that sometimes you may look at areas where it looks like with a more massive, but it's only because maybe in that area the characterization of the data was not as good as the other areas, so it may look like it was more massive, but it's only maybe because you have actually fewer data, so you're not able to characterize the data in details as other areas. So, just to conclude, based with the presentation, a couple of slides of discussion. So, first of all, we deal with the FM modeling. The FM modeling is a stochastic approach, it requires uh, good quality data and uh, lots of data, not lots of data in terms of thousands and thousands of joints, but requires enough data to be able to characterize the 
aleatory variability of the data set. If you have insufficient data, you still can build the DFM model. We have to be aware of the fact that the DFM model is going to be, let's say, limited. It's going to be subjective. So you're going to have more uncertainty associated to it, especially if you use it applied to a geomechanical model. You need always constantly to review the data and add more data to make sure the model becomes more and more refined. So you switch again more closer to the electronic variability range. And eventually, you always have to calibrate it the model, not only in terms of the FM modeling, but any model you run, whether it's like finite element, discrete element, or lattice spring models, every time you have to validate your model. And the conclusion is that also you have to basically look at the problems at different scales. It's not always the same running models at smaller scale or larger scale. The different assumptions you have to make, different basically aspects you have to consider. And always remember that in terms of rock mechanics, we are aware of data, so we know that maybe we have some data we have to collect. We know that we have data that we cannot collect, so we know they may be important, but we don't know those data. But also we have data we, we know we don't know. Like also the data we don't know, we don't know in the sense that they are there, but we're not aware of those data. So there's some kind of three level of kind of uncertainty in the, in the model. Data we know and we can collect, data we don't know, but we would like to collect if we could, and something that we actually we don't know we would like to collect, using kind of paraphrasing a uh, quote from a, an American politician, which Don Ransford used to work for George Bush. That probably says it all. But. Okay, so. That basically concludes the presentation. And if you have questions, actually, you can ask me Italian as well. Okay. Thank you, David, for this very interesting presentation. So we also are looking for questions. <laughs> I actually have a question. Uh, we were out of it together with Doug and we were uh, trying to, let's say, uh, understand which type also of uh, surveys uh, it would be better to uh, prepare in order to build also a DFM. And uh, actually, as you were mentioning, it's not so straightforward. So do you really, do you think that it's anyhow worthy to go back in the field and start with very simple uh, geomechanical surveys or it's better to uh, start with something more, uh, let's say, complex like uh, uh, remote sensing and so on? Mm. For the FMO, you don't really need something more complex. It's just, you need to know what data to collect. The fact that standard guidelines don't include those data sets determination, length is taken in a very, as you say, very subjective way sometimes. As long as you map, map the data, knowing how data is going to be used in the model, then you're going to be okay. So whether you use remote sensing or you do manual, mm -hmm. you, should, you should be aware of what data you need for the, for the DFM model and how the data is going to be interpreted. Okay. I mean, the example about those uh, SRM guidelines, I gave it because when I was working on a project, the data were collected using that guidelines, so the data were given to me was literally this kind of bins, like anything between 3, 10, and 10, but without indication whether it was 4 or 5 or 6. Okay. So if I have to use now um, FIDA distribution, what is the, the average of something which is between 3 and 10, if I don't know whether it's 4 or 5 or 6? So I can find myself in a situation where it's definitely difficult to interpret the data. So if you go back in the field, as it happened in that case, and the, the engineers start to basically map. And this estimate the length, say, is 3.5 meters long. It's 5.5, it actually writes down the length. Then I can, when I go back to the data analysis, I can interpret the data in a better way. So, is it, at least in your opinion, possible that this sort of, uh, let's say, guidelines could be corrected in this way? Or? No, with Doug, actually, we actually trying to really write, write a paper. Write a paper with another one, with suggesting new methods to collect data for, not just for the effect analysis, but for, to account for the new methodologies that we have there, the new sensing as well. Like, we have, as I said, those data sets, or those guidelines refer back to the 70s, 80s. Yeah, yeah. And no one updated those. And even the scale, they say any joints greater than 20 meters is very persistent. 
that's barely a bench in a pit mine. So you, yeah. what happens if you have something longer than five benches? Anyhow, sort of uh, uh, rethinking of this kind of guidelines is needed, yeah. I would say. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, I would like to ask about uh, the, uh, the fracture pressure size. Is it important to collect the data about the fracture pressure size or not? Or so it is, or it uh, depends on the application of, uh, of, uh, of this job? If for what I've been doing so far is geomechanical application, so like more uh, stability analysis. Aperture is not relatively important because we're not looking at the flow of the of water into the into the fracture. If you start looking at like a more hydrogeological problem, then you need to have information about the aperture. Aperture may be relevant for geomechanical when you look at the, whether you have infill material. Infill would change basically the shear strength of the property of the joint. So Knowing whether it's like tight or open may change the uh, assumption of the shear strength. But I mean, if it's open, maybe it's typically there's some different material there. You maybe look open, especially in a blast damage area. You have lots of these open joints, which in reality are actually like tight if you actually go back in the long ways. Yeah. 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 Yeah